Sarah Lewis and Eric William Butler and them labor unions they try to secure for we some measure of decency. But when you check a guy and eat dollar or talk to a Haitian brother, then I sure you'll agree with me that they leave we in misery. I don't want to raise no honestness. Some might say just forgive and forget. But when you check on an English song, to watch me, it's like to one. While riches still gleaming in the British crown. That's all. Come on and pay with us. The Caribbean uneasy. Pay with us. With the struggling currency, boy. Let's remove the poverty line. We want it in cash, not in mind. Come on and pay with us. I hear the prince was visiting. Pay with us. I hope he carried this home with him. It's high time he paid some confirmation to the Caribbean. More than time that they paid some reparation. Thank you. Oh yes, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Politics 101 there. As you know, how I feel about Calypso, the greatest music on the face of the earth. God has given gifts, but when he was sharing gifts, he gave that special gift to the Caribbean. Lady B, Lady B, Lady B, Beulah, died too young. She died of cancer, I think, 20 years ago. Um, but uh, Lady B, she was from uh, uh, Tobago. Tobago, Tobago was a, a sensation when she came on the scene. Um, Lady B, people like Eslin Orr, Eslin Orr went on to do gospel, and she had a calling, and she left Calypso. Lady B, unfortunately, died doing compensation. I think it was the first Calypso in modern times that dealt solely with the issue of compensation. Sparrow had, um, in, his, in his 1963 classic, I'm a Slave, um, he has a stanza in there that talks about, um, and they work and they work with no pay, no pay. And he was talking about, about reparations long before reparations was even into our uh, political lexicon. But um, I think that Calypso compensation by uh, Lady B was the first Calypso that dealt solely with reparations. And that was done over 20 years ago. Lady B, Lady B, um, Beulah, um, she was part of the United Sisters. Some of you would remember the United Sisters. Lady B, Marvelous Marvel, um, singing Sandra, you remember, whoa, donkey, whoa, donkey, the, the, the United Sisters. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting one of the four of them. It was Lady B, uh, uh, singing Sandra, both of them are now dead, Marvelous Marvel, and uh, Joan Rowley, Joan Rowley. Uh, Joan Rowley still competing in the competitions in Trinidad. Marvelous Marvel is there. She doesn't compete as much, but you all will remember them. Um, Keith, Keith Beresford, who is my, who is my guru, my, my um, Calypso guru, um, uh, would remember the United Sisters. Lady Beulah doing their compensation, and there have been a string of Calypso since then. No, I am giving you all wrong information. Before this Calypso, by Lady B. Um, Chalk Dust had done grandfather's back pay, my grandfather's back pay. And Chalk Dust did that in 1981 or 82. And you heard Lady B referencing, you remember Chalky tell them, I want my grandfather's back pay. So Chalk Dust sang about reparations in the early 1980s, my grandfather's back pay my grandfather's back pay. So we're going to be talking about reparations conversation um, with Eric Phillips. He's ready and raring to go. 
And if you listen to that Calypso by Lady B, she framed the reparations in a pan-Caribbean perspective, from a pan-Caribbean perspective, pay me reparations for slavery and indentureship. Now, if you listen to the commentary, she references slavery. That's our reference. And indentureship is thrown in because she is using a Caribbean frame. Caribbean frame. But when it comes to the evidence, the only evidence she presents is the evidence from the slave plantation. Quite interesting. Quite interesting. Yeah? But she's using a Caribbean perspective. Now, where am I going with that? I'm going, I'm going to stop two places before I bring in Eric Phillips. When I was a graduate student, and I did a class called Pan-Africanism with uh, 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 the late, great African-American professor Ron Walters, who was then at Howard. And um, uh, there are two things in that class. When it came to Guyana, uh, Dr. Walters said Guyana, uh, the Caribbean, <coughs> is a very difficult place to talk about Pan-Africanism because of the multiracial nature of the society and because of the creolization. It is very difficult to talk about Pan-Africanism. And he said, our Pan-Africanism in the Caribbean is more of a class Pan-Africanism. Uh, uh, but it also has some connotations. And uh, he gave the example of Burnham and Quayana. Uh, and he had written a book on, on that we were using in the class on Pan-Africanism. And uh, he said to African-American freedom fighters, Burnham was the third world leader who was most open to African Americans and others coming. They went uh, to Ghana uh, after Nkrumah came to power in 57. And then when Nkrumah was overthrown in 64, some of them went to Tanzania and the rest of them came to Guyana. So Burnham was open to African freedom fighters. He was playing an important role in Southern Africa. And then you have Guyana who is the father of Guyanese and West Indian Pan-Africanism, father of West Indian and, and, and Guyanese and Caribbean Black Power. Askre, which was formed in 1964, predated the Black Power Movement. Black Power Movement came on stream in the Caribbean in 1968, but Askre was formed in 1964. And so Guyan is seen as the pioneer in organized Black Power and Pan-Africanism. And then you have Walter Rodney, who is at that time was the rock star when it came to Black Power and Pan-Africanism, right? Known on the continent for his work there in Africa, known in Jamaica, known in the United States, um, and of course, Guyana. And Dr. Dr. Walters said, if you are a black powerist, a black nationalist in America, you don't know what to do with Guyana. Because here you have these three personalities and you have two of them in one party, Burnham in the government, and they're fighting. And, and, and two black Americans, Burnham, Rodney, and Guyana, all three of them meant a great deal. So he said, Guyana and the Caribbean is a difficult place. So he asked me to take the class. And I, I took the class. The students were a little bit thing, but Dr. Walters had known that I was from Guyana and that I had known Rodney and Quayana and was part of the movement and so on. Um, so I wanted to say that, right? That Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism, when it comes to the Caribbean, because of the way in which the races and the ethnicities are there and they're mixed up. It is difficult to really articulate. So when we talk about Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism from a Caribbean standpoint, we are talking about a class-based Black nationalism that Rodney saw Black power as including Indian people. 
Indian, as in Indian to Indo Trinidadians, Indian, Indo um, Guyanese, etc. He saw them as part of Pan Africanism. And in 1970, during the Trinidad Revolution, Black Power Revolution, Geddes Granger and, 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 and the NJAC people, they, they went down into the cane fields and, 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 and the Indian communities. They marched there and they brought some Indians with them into the march. So they also subscribed to a Caribbean black power that was class-based rather than race-based. You see, in America, <laughs> there's no class-based Pan-Africanism. Black is black, right? Black is black. Right? Whereas being the Caribbean in Jamaica, we would call a mulatto mixed person, a brown man. In America, he's a black man, WB Du Bois. <laughs> I need a brown man if he was in Jamaica. But he's black. So I wanted to stop there to say, and uh, okay, so where I'm going with that? This week, Eric Phillips wrote a letter in the newspaper. Every now and again, there is a, there's what you call a bombshell letter that jolts everybody um, to, 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 to their senses. And he wrote this letter this week um, uh, in the newspapers. And I saw it the night and I, um, of course, shared it, um, shared it uh, 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 on my paid Facebook pages, my website and so on, because I sense from the time I read the first paragraph, I sense it was one of those bombshell uh, moments, uh, and 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 so I shared it. Now, what uh, is Eric arguing? Um, uh, what is Eric? What is Eric arguing in that piece? That piece. I'm trying to get it up on the screen here for you all, so that you can see it. Um, this is my headline, Eric Phillips called for separate CARICOM reparation commissions for indentureship and colonialism. And Eric is arguing that, look, we have to deal with four phenomena, four phenomena in the Caribbean. We have to deal with genocide against Native Indians. We have to deal with chattel slavery and everything that came with that. We have to deal with indentureship, and then we have to deal with colonialism. And you know, I have been a university teacher for over 30 odd years, right? And I've taught all of those things. But the way in which Eric framed it, I had never really seen it that way because I'm teaching Caribbean politics or black politics. And there's a way when you know you, you we scholars do, we kind of conflate everything and we don't always problematize um uh the, the the thing and it it occurred to me that there there is something in common with all four of those constructs in that they include they include oppression there is even genocide when it comes to native indians right there's a common thread through slavery Native Indian, anti-Native Indian genocide, indentureship, colonialism, there is a kind of brutality. There's a kind of oppression that runs through all four of them. But in many regards, they are different. As much as they're same, you know, you always hear that when we talk about race in Guyana, oh, we are all the same, right? And that's easy because it gives us an easy out. It gives us an easy out. If we're all the same, then we don't have to worry about problems and so on. We're all the same. But it was David Rudder said, how we party is not how we vote, <laughs> right? And so although those four constructs have a, a thread running through them, they're different. And perhaps the one that is most different, not perhaps, definitely the one that is most different is chattel slavery. The world never seen anything before like that. And the world never seen anything since then like that. Chattel slavery is in a league on its own. And so 
when the original reparation conversation started, it was about chattel slavery. It was about reparations of slavery. But as I said, our Caribbean is this hybrid plural space. And that in many ways, slavery is linked to anti the genocide against native Indians. It is linked to um, uh, 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 indentureship uh, because slavery in many regards, the end of slavery, emancipation, meant all those who were coming after us did not come a slave. They came in oppressive circumstances, they uh, think, but not as slaves. And then colonialism, one can, one can say colonialism covers everything from Columbus landing here to when we became independent. Uh, uh, all right? But chattel slavery is in a league by its own. I remember once writing that uh, it, it was emancipation article and I was, I had in mind young people. And so I said, you know, one of the things about slavery is if the master feel you behave badly, cut off your finger or cut off your ears. And I, 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 I got a call from Andai, the late Andai, who was very thoughtful, very harsh on you when you write things. So I said, Lord God, what did I write here now that Andai? She said, no, 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 no. She wants to know what was going through my mind when I gave that example, when I wrote that. And I said, I was thinking about the new generation who may not understand that slavery is in a league by itself. And she said, well, you have accomplished that because in all our years of trying to do what I am doing, which is trying to explain slavery without offending others, she had never gotten that sweet spot that I found there, right? Um, and, 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 and I think uh, you write things and you do not necessarily know that you hit a spot until somebody else tells you that you hit a spot. And, and, and it, when I read back what I write, I said, but and I, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, on the indentureship, the master, uh, the plantation owner or manager cut off your finger, you gotta face the law. You gotta face the law. Under, in the, under slavery, he didn't have to face the law, you're his property. And so therefore, Eric brought us back down to earth and to say, first of all, when CARICOM framed the thing about reparation, they include genocide against native Indians along with slavery. And now CARICOM has added to that list indentureship and colonialism. And what Eric is arguing, which I completely agree with, is that there is need for compensation for all four. But that need for compensation for all four has to take in consideration that one of the four was in a league by its own. And so therefore, that is what brought us to this program tonight. We have had our conversations only last year when the British people um, visit, visited the family that owned slave visited and they apologized. And there was, uh, you know, a tendency to twin or to marry slavery and indentureship. And we had a big conversation over it. And we were able to push back those who were trying to say the two are the same. The next day, none other than Kit Nascimento, who is one of those who would tend to lump all the same. See, Kit Nascimento is Portuguese. And in ethnic studies, there's something what we call the middlemen. These are small groups in ethnically divided societies that decide that they're not interested in politics. They're interested in an economic space. And so they forego the politics and they participate in the economic space and they use that influence in the economic space in order to influence the politics. 
And we know the Portuguese have been playing that role in Guyana for a long time. Um, in, in Barbados, there's this, the white population there, not small, it's more sizable than the Portuguese population. And so they play that role there. If you go to places like Kenya and some of the African countries, you find that small, white, sometimes mixed population. In Jamaica, it's white and mixed, right? And they are what we call the middle, middle, middlemen. So, uh, and, and they tend to latch on to these so-called nationalists out of one, many, one people, one nation, destiny, and so on, because they benefit economically um, from, from that construct. So uh, Kit Rodinex then congratulated uh, uh, Eric for Eric's letter. And what stood out to me is that he said for the first time, he really got a good analysis of the difference between the four construct, colonialism, indentureship, slavery, um, genocide against, uh, against Native Indians. Now, whether he agrees with Eric's conclusion is another, is another question. He didn't say that, but he said he got a good analysis. And I, I have to admit, too, that it was the best that I have seen in the public arena. And so here we are tonight to talk again about reparations. Eric Phillips is here. And to talk about the issues that Eric raised in the letter. There are some uncomfortable truths. I remember when Eric first raised the issue of relations between um, uh, Amerindians and Africans. He said very plainly, they served as slave catchers. They may have played a, a, a pivotal role in the, um, the, 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 the military defeat of the um, Coffee's Band, the, uh, the Essequibo Revol the Bobby's Revolution. Note I said military defeat because I did not believe that Coffee and them were defeated. They were defeated militarily. But I think politically, they were not defeated. They struck a very important blow. But Eric was bold enough to raise that. And a lot of people were angry with him because it, you know, this feel good, one people, one nation, one destiny, is that we're not supposed to be talking about our differences. We're not supposed to be talking about some of our bad story. But anyhow, I think I've given you all enough of a frame for our discussion tonight. Let me bring in Eric Phil. Uh, Brother Eric, good evening. Good evening, Chief. How are you? I am surviving, as they say, by Almighty God's grace. He's my sword and my shield. And you know, we in the Caribbean, God is not a religious thing for the most part. It's cultural. God is cultural. That even atheists call on God. <laughs> um, Eric, is there anything in my introduction that you would like to add to, you would like to amplify so to get the conversation started? David, you captured it very well. And it took me about two weeks to clear my thoughts and to want to put it in the public domain. Because many African organizations, not only in Guyana, but especially in Suriname and in Jamaica, were very upset when they saw CARICOM lump indentureship into the reparations conversation. And they felt as if this was to slow down the reparations movement because it had been 10 years with a lot of progress, with the King of Netherlands apologizing, the Prime Minister, the Church of England, um, nine um, areas, or what we would call states in Holland, Lloyds of London, on and on and on. And many people felt that why are Indians now jumping on in this process when for 10 years they were silent. And so I thought I should clarify it because a lot of people kept saying indentureship is the second slavery, which is a fundamental lie. And so I had to articulate the differences among the four, but also to make the argument that you so brilliantly spoke of 
we all had harms, but the harms are different. And we need to address them differently. Indentorship was not a crime against humanity, but indigenous genocide and African enslavement are. And that's why the UN had two decades for indigenous people. And we are now coming to the end of the first decade for African people because it was a crime against humanity. And also the fact that we live in this same space, we need to be cognizant that everyone needs to be, to be healed because it was a process starting in Africa, then into indigenous genocide, African enslavement, um, indentorship after emancipation, and then the broader issue of colonialism. And I wanted to do so because the Dutch apologized, but the Dutch had indentured in Suriname. And the Dutch also still have colonies, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, St. Bart. And so the Dutch apologizing created a lot of confusion because the Dutch have absolutely refused to deal with indentorship. And when their ambassador came to Suriname and to Guyana, and they, he was asked about it by both our president and President Santoki, he basically said, we're here to deal with African enslavement. And now because of the geopolitics of having um, both Ali and Santoki on the prime ministerial subcommittee on reparations, the issue has been coming up. And Professor Vereen Shepard, as well as Sir Hilary Beckles, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, have been under a lot of pressure by the Indo-Caribbean Diaspora Network by basically saying that for the last 10 years, you've been dealing with Black people business. What about our harms? So it's been almost a year of debate within the commission. And ultimately, the commission reports to the prime ministerial subcommittee, which is comprised of Barbados, chaired by Mia Motley, St. Vincent, Prime Minister Gonzalez, Suriname, Santoki, Guyana, Ali, and Haiti of all, all groups. And they have been given the right by CARICOM to manage the reparations issue. And so they asked us to look at how it can be broadened and we did that. So we spent four days in Jamaica last month rewriting the 10-point plan because it's been a decade and lots of things have happened to include the diaspora, to include women. And so the whole issue of how do you include indentorship, how do you deal with colonization, especially since the Dutch still have colonies. So I was able to try to articulate the differences and to call for separate commissions because we need to. And just to give you an example why. Rihanna, everybody knows about Rihanna. Guyanese mother, Barbadian father. Name is Fenty. Fenty is Irish. And most people forget that 50,000 indentured servants went to Barbados. And right now, there are about 800 of them called Red Legs who Red still legs. live there, and they're very poor. So if you mix that indentorship into indigenous genocide and African enslavement, chattel slavery, which are crimes, then you reach a, solution, a situation of total confusion and total delays because you can't go to the courts and fight a crime against humanity and add at the back of it a contract dispute. Yeah. And so as much as Mia Motley and President Ali and President Santoki were pushing this for Caribbean unity and broader geopolitical issues, there are lots of complexity. So I tried to articulate what they are, how they're different, and how we should approach it. Because if you were to add indentorship to the current Guyana Reparations Committee, then you'd have to add Chinese, yes. Indian, yes. Portuguese. Portuguese. We forget that there were Germans, Germans. in Guyana too, in yeah. the, and then Africans are indentured too. Africans, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then if you're in Barbados, yes. how do you deal with the Irish? So I 
I thought that for clarity, for unity, to get rid of the racial divisiveness that came with all the calls I got, that I had to put something out there. And also to guide our, our, our prime ministers. Because oftentimes our prime ministers act for political reasons. And the, in Suriname, Armand Zunda, who's the head of the Surinamese Reparations Committee, he was approached by indo surinamese to join his committee. And he didn't know what to do because for indentorship, the question is, what are the harms? They're well known for indigenous genocide and African slavery. How do you value those harm, harms and who are involved? Indentorship was driven by a law, an immigration act. It didn't start in the Caribbean. It started in, in Mauritius and Seychelles and Fiji and South Africa. That's where Gandhi was, was in South Africa. And so you're dealing with the British and to some extent the Dutch and those countries and India because it was passed in the Indian parliament and passed by the Indian government. And as you said, there were a lot of regulations, your food, your religion, your pay, what you got after, the length of time. And although African enslavement was a collective punishment, in essence, in dentorship, you signed individual contracts and you had to go in front of a lawyer to say that you were going willingly. And then you had to go on the three medical tests before they put you on the ship. So they're so fundamentally different. They happened in different time periods. As you said, after emancipation, they came as free people, not as enslaved. So that's what I tried to do because it was getting very rancious. And I thought that we're mature enough to start speaking honestly about our history. And if we do that, then we have to separ have separate commissions. Separate commissions. And that point I want to be um, hammered in so that those who are standing on the sidelines to say, you know, Eric Phillips uh, don't want uh, East Indians to get reparations. Eric Phillips is saying very clearly here that there needs to be a commission for compensation and reparations for indentureship because there was harm done to Indian people. But he's arguing strenuously that if you lump indentureship with slavery and genocide against Native Indians and then put colonialism in on that, then you begin to lose focus. You begin to lose focus. And as I said in my introduction, the complexity of the Caribbean is some, those of us who study the Caribbean, teach the Caribbean, Eric, you know that very well because you study it, you teach it, know that it's not an easy space to deal with at all. It's not an easy space. You're talking about ethnic differences, racial differences, national differences, mm -hmm. Uh, but running through that is a thread of sameness. And yeah. sameness is a wonderful thing, but sameness is also a very boring thing. If all of us were five feet, ten inches, what the world would 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 would, would, would have been it would have been a boring place. So although we tend to talk about sameness, we don't always recognize that our sameness really arises out um of that human beings define ourselves not by sameness, but by difference. I am tall, and in saying I'm tall is because I'm not short. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I am fat. In effect, what I'm saying is that I'm not MAGA. I ain't thin, right? I I I like tall, dark men. You know, some women like to say that you, you are prejudiced against short men. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we define ourselves every day by our differences. I don't like spicy food. What you're saying? You're prejudiced against spicy food. <laughs> and so we define ourselves by our differences. And so difference is not a bad thing. What is bad is when people exploit differences yes. as they did in, during slavery. Exploit um, exploit, exploit differences, skin color difference, and they yes. give meaning to it. That's what they did. They said this color got religious meaning, 
It got <laughs> economic meaning. It got political meaning. It got sexual meaning. It got all kinds of things, and they put meaning to it. So it is not the difference between black and white and brown that's the problem. It's the meaning we give to blackness or brownness or whiteness. You see? And so, therefore, I want you all to hear what Eric Phillips is saying here tonight. What we need are different commissions. In Guyana and Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean, we are several people striving for one nation with one destiny. And we could get there if they listen to people like Eric Phillips and Vincent Alexander and myself and 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 Arby Norton was in that jam too. Um, two decades ago, three decades ago, we could have been halfway down the road because we said the way you deal with our differences is not to deny it, but to accommodate it in the governance system, right? Yes. Um, with all due respect to us, Kwayana raised it way back in 1961, long before Aaron Leipard, who is now the leading scholar, um, uh, raised it, long before um, Sir Arthur Lewis wrote its seminal, yeah. its seminal book in 1965. So, Eric, I just want to thank you for bringing this matter into the open again, and because we have to settle it. We have to settle it. Now, let me... Let me let me let me ask you if we were to go down the road that you are suggesting separate commissions how would we what would it look like you are always i'm always amazed at your ability to chart things out and and, and think tell us what well, it would look like we have a structure right now for indigenous genocide and african slavery mm -hmm. i would see a separate committee and it could even be managed by the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations, which is the umbrella group. And it indeed has Guyana and Suriname, which has this multi-racial thing. And then each country could have a committee. Mm -hmm. um, and they would do their history. Because yeah. part of the proof is a corrective history of indentureship in Guyana, which is different than in Suriname and different in Trinidad. And you bring the facts together, similar to what we did in this book, which is the Guyana reparation story for people of African descent. And so you articulate the history, you document it, and then you could use that as the basis for identifying the harms, and then you could value it. But these committees, you have one in the specific countries in the Caribbean where you had indentureship. You have Suriname. You have um, Seychelles, you have South Africa. All of these would now be an umbrella group dealing with the same issue because you're all dealing with the British, India, and Holland. Reparations for indigenous people in African um, and chattel slavery is 10 countries. It's a crime. It's a different legal strategy. It's a different diplomatic strategy. 10 years of work has been done by CARICOM on the back of over 100 years of reparations work. Now, indentureship has to do that type of work. And it will take time, like it took us, to document it accurately and to start to create a framework. Is there going to be a 10-point plan for indentureship? What are the harms? Who pays whom? How do you deal with that? So I think... If there's in chemistry, and I always love my German lecture for this, we had degrees of freedom theory in thermodynamics. He says, if you have too much information, you can never solve the problem because some of the information leads you down different paths. If we were to mix reparations with indentureship, it is so broad that you really can't focus on what your strategy should be and how you approach it. But in terms of indentorship, since it can't be a legal case in the sense of a crime against humanity, it's a negotiation, it's a contract negotiation. It's a diplomatic solution. And you need to hear the voices of India because there were a million Indians who went on this path. And before coming to Guyana, 
500,000 went to Seychelles and Fiji and South Africa. And they had a different experience because it's a different cultural environment. Mm -hmm. And the benefits were different in terms of pay, in terms of duration, and the harms were different. So you have to separate the two. If not, no one will move forward. And there will be racial animosity. And, and, and I think that point is well taken. Um, one of the critiques that some of us have been making about our situation in Guyana and the Caribbean and, and to a large extent in the United States of America is that Indian people do not understand, the, by and large, the African problem. Uh, Portuguese people don't. Africans have a better sense of the problems of others because um, <clears throat> because of the nature of slavery itself. Yeah. I mean, you, you had to understand white people in order to beat them and to overcome that institution that they were using. You really had to understand them in a way that they didn't have to understand you because you were chattel. Yeah. You are not people. So, you know, you don't have to understand your property. You have to understand the value of your property. <laughs> but that's your property. <laughs> right. But, 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 but so, in that sense, Africans, by necessity, had to have a sense. We had to have a sense of Indians and Portuguese and Chinese because they came. And immediately as they came, they were pitted in conflict with Africans yes. and yes. so forth. So I'm not saying that Africans are unique. There's something God put in African people ahead. It is the circumstances. But the critique is that we don't have an understanding, a thorough understanding of the nature of our ethnic communities. And I know you have been pushing for this. And the late Walter Rodney had begun to address it. And that is in our education system. system. Yeah, It's not just saying Indians came from India, Africans came from Africa. But we need to do a critical analysis for our children to understand it was not just coming. It was coming in certain circumstances. And I think that is where we think so we become adults. And we have notions of each other that is more folklore Yes. Than, than, than actual reality. And I have to say, you know, in fairness to people like yourself and Alexander and Nigel Hughes and the David Hines and Augusti and so on, that there is a group of Africans. I noticed my friend um, Donald Ramatata about Indian nationalists and African nationalists in, in his <laughs> reply to the people about Jagger. And I have to say, I am not an expert in Indian nationalist, but I'm an expert on African nationalist because I belong to that community. And by necessity, African nationalists have to grapple with a whole range of issues. We have to grapple with class. We have to grapple with gender. We have to grapple with nationalism, meaning the nation state. We have to grapple with international relations in a different way. <laughs> Pan Africanism, yeah, and, and, exactly, and so therefore, um, when you talk about African, as you know, Rodney used to shout at them. He says the African scholar has a duty to the African people. When you finish reading all them book, at the end of the day, what you're reading them for, and he said yes. we have to put what we have learned at the service of. We can shock that responsibility then. In a sense that they've invested in us. So I hear the talk about African nationalists as some of the other, that's all we are. I know Eric Phillips is an African nationalist, but he's many, many other things, right? He's an engineer, he's, uh, he's a businessman. They try to get to wise us as though we are one thing and so forth. Yeah. Um, Eric, clearly what you just said there, a place like Nevis, there'd be no need for an, it, right. <laughs> a commission on indentureship. Right. I mean, is that complex? Oh, yes. Um, let me, let me, I want you to ex explain colonialism for an audience, because I think those of us who read it, we got the Native Indian thing quickly. We got the African thing. We got the indentureship thing. But colonialism is a hardy. And given, given the whole 
historic arc and, 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 and so forth. But I, I thought when I saw your thing, I said, Lord, brilliant here. Explain to us how colonialism is, is, is different from the others within the context of our call for reparations. Let me read what I wrote Good. and then I'll explain exactly. it. Exactly. I wrote colonialism is the political and economic domination, administration, and influence of the European and other foreign powers over the Caribbean territories and people, which resulted in the modernization, globalization, and cooperation of the Caribbean region, as well as the disruption, oppression, and dependency of the Caribbean nations and cultures. So it's many things. <clears throat> as you put it first and, and best, it was a system of extreme oppression. Yes. But it had sinister parts to it. And we're still suffering from neocolonialism today because we've inherited what they have wanted us to inherit. So even if you were to look at our oil contract, that is colonialism in an extreme sense in that you have resources and you're, you're being dominated with your resources because of some construct called the sanctity of contracts and international law, even though, even though you know it's an odious contract and you can't do anything because the international architecture is supportive of colonialism. It is also a system of extreme exploitation. It is a system of imperialism. It is a system where you are forced to adopt other people's cultures, their religion, their attitudes. And if you don't comply, then you are deemed to be, as they're doing in Haiti now, you're gang. You are outside of, of societal norms. So colonialism is very, very silent, very, very dangerous, because we don't think of it, because we become independent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet, everything we have in Guyana, what is the Westminster system, is a colonial system. Yes. That doesn't suit our needs as a multicultural nation. Because when you say winner take all, that's for a homogeneous society. Yeah. It doesn't matter who wins, you're all the same. But in a winner-take-all system in a place like Guyana, where you have these ethnic groups, it means that there's exclusion and inclusion, and that is against even the philosophy of being one people, one nation, one destiny. So colonialism is what has led to this capitalism that we have, because they're linked. Yeah. Colonialism was the basis of capitalism. Slavery was the basis of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So they're linked. Yeah. And so we talk about colonial powers and you look at Gaza. Mm -hmm. That gives you a sense of what colonial powers do. Um, they're settlers and they dominate every aspect of another people's lives. And that's the same thing that we went through and are still going through in our legislature, in our political system, in our education system. I mean, Indians were told they had to, to convert to Christianity. I'm born a Hindu, and you were telling me that you can't go to school unless you're a Christian. So all of these are colonial things that are there to divide and rule and to dominate. So while you're busy fighting among yourselves, they're taking the land and everything. And so it's a legal system, yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental system, it's an economic system of ec oppression and exploitation. And sadly enough, enough of us are trained to become neo-colonists to oppress our own people. Our own people. Our own and people. that is the goal of colonialism, to grow uh -huh. itself. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Take me back to Chino Atribi, who I think is a series yes. of books. I, 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 you yeah. know, I mean, Eric, you know, things fall uh, apart. Things yeah. fall apart, and I, some of the others, I'm, I am, I am, I'm, I'm forgetting. No, 
but it's about and even black skin, white mass, how that was treated. I know. It's about colonialism. Yeah, yeah. And I think they probe that colonial thing. Here's my question to you, Eric. How do we then frame reparations for colonialism? David, it's extraordinarily difficult. And that's why I wanted to separate it into something else. There you go. New Zealand is a colony. Yes. Canada Australia. is a colony. Australia is a, can is a colony. Canada. So how do you deal with that from a legal point of view, from an international law perspective? It, it is so ambiguous, it's so am amorphous, but so real. So we understand it in the context that the Dutch have apologized and part of reparations is non-repetition. Therefore, you should not have colonies. So we're dealing with it in a Caribbean space like that. But when you open it to the broader context of colonization, I don't know how you address it. Yeah. Because the world is built around colonization. Yeah, yeah. yeah and there, yeah. nobody's going to take themselves to court or give up the power that they've gotten from colonization. And how do you value it? How many yeah. lives have been lost? What has been extracted? What has been stolen? It, it is so messy that if you were to bring it together in this reparations movement in one committee, yes. where do you go? Where do you go? And and when you consider our Caribbean, our CARICOM Caribbean, where oh, Barbados complex. was a settler colony, yes, as opposed to the rest of us, yes, not settler colonies. So then you get into a whole kind of thing. And many people did not realize at one time Barbados seceded from the yes. British. And, and then the French colonies are different yes. than the Dutch and are different from the British because the legal systems are different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Barbados has the second oldest parliament in the world after England. People don't know that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right? And they and got that the before. Black code out That's of Barbados. Right. Yeah. They got that because white people were there, they settled there. Yes. And they said, what you are doing to the slave has nothing to do with me. <laughs> you got to treat me like human beings. And, and then to see, make it even more complex, David, colonialism is indigenous genocide, is African enslavement, is indentureship. They're all yes. part of a process. All part and of a so process. You, yeah. Yeah, Eric Phillips here tonight. As you can see, I'm enjoying this conversation always, and I'm sure I know that you all are enjoying. I see a whole set of you just joined us recently. We would like to welcome back Cam's TV viewers. There were some technical problems, but we're back now. We don't have the AP and new AFC people here tonight because we have to share their platform with their thing, and whenever they have a program, you know, we don't get them here. But I notice uh, a lot of you are here. As I said, um, previously that uh, YouTube, our YouTube audience has grown 60 to 70% of our audience now is drawing in from YouTube, um, which, which, which I think shows the diversity of our audience. And I know some big wig PPP people are regular <laughs> viewers of the program and uh, nice PPP people. Nice, 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 nice. The, 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 the not so nice ones have spies <laughs> reporting to them, but the nice ones are usually on, and some of them do send me comments. Um, uh, uh, favorable, sometimes unfavorable, but favorable um, comments. Um, e Eric, let's uh, um, uh, 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 step away a little bit from 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 reparations and i say a little bit because it's not totally and let's go to haiti yes because haiti is part of caricom as you know they're part of the reparations committee as you said yeah and haiti paid reparations which is the reverse uh, uh -huh, uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. an historical fact that our people black people in particular but all guyanese and caribbean people must know you, you know, that Haiti paid reparations. I know when I teach my students who grew up here in Haiti, is the poorest country in the hemisphere. And then you go through the history of Haiti. A lot of my students break down sometime and cry. Yeah. You know, it's ignorance, tragic. ignorance yeah. is a hell of a thing. 
And but you know, David, that ignorance is something. Yeah, I was problem. looking at it today. Yeah, because indeed, as you mentioned, the 1763 rebellion preceded the Haitian Revolution. Yes, and most people don't realize that 200,000 Africans died in that Haitian Revolution. 20,000 colonists died. 25,000 British died, and 45,000 French died. Repeat those that was a repeat, massive repeat, war. Repeat those statistics, Eric Phillips. Please do. Yeah, 200,000 Africans died out of a population of 500,000. And that Asian revolution lasted for almost a decade, 1791. Yes, from, yeah, 1791 yeah. to 1804. Right. Uh -huh. right. 20,000 colonists or owners of plantations died. 45,000 French died. And 25,000 British died because the British came to support the French. And since then, because Haiti became the first successful country with a revolt, it's been put in a spin. Of course, you see Cuba had a similar thing. But Haiti was one of the richest countries in the world. Haiti at the time of the revolution was producing 40% of all the wealth in the slave environment. The most prosperous, most prosperous sugar yes. colony, yes, ever. More prosperous than Brazil, yes. And yes. Brazil was a big. And they deal. were doing five different products. Yeah, and it was the largest slave population except Brazil. Yes, but it was uh, and it was French, and when the Haitians won, they made an incredible statement. They said anyone who reaches to Haiti, we will protect you as being free any African enslaved African. And so they started this philosophy that is really truly about freedom and the West never forgave them. And so if you go through the history of Haiti, they paid 150 million francs in reparations, which because of interest became much larger. They had to borrow money that killed the economy, that sort of, cramped their whole economic architecture. And then the Americans came in, took away all their gold out of their bank, and have since then been oppressing Haiti. And stayed there for 19 years, from 1915 yes. to 1934. Yes. And then when Aristide called for reparations, they deposed him. He was the first leader in the Caribbean to call for reparations. And because of that, that's what they did to him. But Haiti is oppressed. Haiti has a lot of wealth. Haiti has one of the largest resources of iridium. Haiti has oil and gas offshore. And so it's a struggle. And most people don't know that there's still cruise ships going to Haiti right now. Right now. Right now as right we now. speak. In the, yeah. And most people don't realize who are the 10 top business people in Haiti. It is extremely wealthy, yep. but it's been positioned as the poorest because it's been made poor to extraction and oppression. And also, these gangs are not gangs. They are people fighting for their freedom. Of course, they were linked to politicians. Each, I mean, the Tom Tom Akus, that was with uh, Papa Doc and Baby Doc. So there's a history. But nothing happens in Haiti without American saying happens. Mm. And that solution is an American solution that CARICOM had to embrace. Because who's going to pay for it? $400 million. What is frightening, though, is that you're asking people from Kenya and Benin to come into a war zone where you have no cultural affinity Yes. where you don't understand the, the it's urban warfare so it's you're bringing them there to fail so it's worrisome but people must realize that haiti the lives that are lost in haiti and the amount of wealth extracted out of haiti since 1825 1825 yes the, the slave ships are going to labadee You'll see your bright audience here. Yeah, Norwegian, Norwegian, yeah. The guys are. You'll see your bright audience here. I have to say that, you know, you got breakdown thing for people and so on. What nonsense. 
Eric, if I miss a beat, if I miss a date here, within a minute, somebody in this audience provides me with the detail. And yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing what of the, the, the wealth of knowledge that resides in our people. And as, as my aunt used to say, you think me ignorant? Just stick with me. <laughs> and, and, and what we do on a program like this is stick with them. And, and, and the knowledge just, it's there, it's there. You see how quick we, brother, get it there, all, all set. Eric, you touched on something there, the gangs. You know, I am sensitive to that term. Yes, it's a racial term. Because you know term. how they refer to us who are opposition yes. in Guyana, right? It's a racial term. Racial it's... derogative term. Racially derogative yes. term. Yes. And they know better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this transition, already they're talking who could be part of the transition and who cannot be part of it. Yeah, barbecue cannot be part. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you if you agree that... As part of the transition, they have got to sit down with some of those people, those leaders they're calling gang people. Yeah. G9 or else this and thing, other, and, and this thing ain't going no way. Yes. Well, Barbecue's already said he's not accepting the solution. There you go. That was imposed on them because they're excluded. And this is an American philosophy. They always try to exclude the people who died to bring the thing to happen. So barbecue and all of them, as much as they're gangs and they're involved in other things, how can you leave them out? Because they were previously linked to politicians, and those politicians are going to be part of the council. And all you're doing is creating a win-lose situation. Because there should have been some, some dialogue with them to be part of it. Because you can't exclude them. They control 80% of Port-au-Prince. They control the, 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 where the food is, you know. And America is smart. They took out all of their people by helicopter. They land a special force and took them out because they know that if the Kenyans come in and the Beninians come in and there is no political architecture to work with them, it's black on black crime. There you go. There you go. And the previous experience with... Uh... These a foreign so force. forces, these foreign forces, is not been a good one, and it has left the. Oh, there were there were murders, extrajudicial killings. There's cholera that killed ten thousand people. There's rape. rape. There was stealing of resources. Yeah, it, it's it's sad. Sisters and brothers, y'all are hearing it here. Q, um, the situation in Haiti is complex. And I, I can't help but, and I hope that you all are hearing it tonight as you all are hearing it every night. When but you Dave, talk, what is very sad yeah. is that they're part of CARICOM. Yeah. They're the largest nation in CARICOM. Without Haiti, we are about 4 million. With Haiti, we're 16 million. And yet we have done worse than the Americans to them. People don't realize that, that hurricane in the Bahamas killed 6,000 Haitians. Yes, yes. Nobody talks yes, about it. Yes, and it's, then they it's come invisible to the islands, and because of a lack of space or language or whatever, they're chased away. They come to Guyana where we have the space, and we chase them away, but we bring 100,000 Venezuelans in who are not from Carica. So that also talks about this whole issue again as to who we are as a people. We should be holding Haiti. They're one of the most productive people in the world. Oh, the Haitian diaspora in New York and the tri-state area, oh, they have everything. Oh man! Even in Canada, you have a Haitian who is in one of the top positions. In New York, the same thing. And yet, because of our racial separateness, we do just as bad to them as the for other foreign groups. Just as bad to them um, as other foreign groups. Um, um, Eric, give us a progress report. I know you've been traveling recently on reparations business. Give us a yeah. progress report of where 
where the reparations are at the level of CARICOM. Tremendous progress, David. Last year, we had a quantum leap in many ways. There was a valuation on reparations done by the Brattle Group, which is a very credible international group. And they were asked to do this by Patrick Robinson, who is a current judge on the ICJ. Mm -hmm. And that study was comprehensive, and it basically said that 31 countries owe 107 trillion. And it was well documented, loss of life, loss of labor, sexual harassment, this, that, that. Well documented in any in, in an accounting manner that is irrefutable. For example, the Dutch owes Guyana 50 billion pounds. The British owes us about $3 trillion. That's documented. There's also a breakthrough with the Africa Union and CARICOM in that at a conference in November in Accra, there was an agreement that they would work together because it started in Africa. And Africa is now waking up to claim reparations for all the damage done there. So there's that agreement that there will be a common group of lawyers coming together from the diaspora and the Africa Union to look at what are the legal solutions or legal options. There is also a lot of movement with the diaspora. For the first time, reparations groups were created outside of CARICOM. There's one in Holland, the Netherlands Reparations Committee, because we left out the diaspora. What mm -hmm. about Guyanese and other Caribbean people who are in the UK? who are in Holland, who are in France, um, who are in Spain. So we started to acknowledge that we have to be more inclusive. So we've rewritten the 10-point plan, and that would be more inclusive. We are looking at a different management structure in terms of how we approach 10 European countries. And there is now so much going on in terms of apologies. The Dutch apologize. As I mentioned, 10 of their provinces apologized in Holland. The Guardian apologized, Lloyds of London apologized, the Church of England is now looking at a hundred million to $1 billion fund, repertory justice, um, rotating fund. Um, CARICOM is looking to create a dialogue now with these European countries to start to discuss the 10 point plan. And so the momentum is dramatic. And I think to some extent, this indentureship and colonialism is a byproduct of the success of what has happened mm -hmm. in indentureship, mm -hmm. I mean, indentured uh, indigenous genocide and African slavery. The American movement has gained a lot of momentum. There are over 240 groups in America dealing with reparations at the local, regional, and national level. I know Biden has, ha has been asked to do an executive order so that HR 40 could come into play. And now there's a move to a global reparations movement in which the current president of Ghana, who will leave office in December, will lead the African diaspora, Afri will lead Africa into this movement. We have Colombia with Vice President Marquez, who will lead the Latin American side together with some Brazilian counterpart. And so you're seeing a holistic move now in which Africa and its diaspora, the six region, are making this a priority. But the Caribbean is the most advanced and that's because we're sovereign states and we have dedicated groups and we're smaller. Um, North America, England, Holland, they're all working in tune now with CARICOM, even though there may be some disagreements on the elements of the 10-point plan. We have the traditional kings and queens on board now, pushing in their own countries. And then we have the United Nations Permanent Forum, which will meet in Geneva next month. And one of the topics is reparations, sustainable development, etc. So everything seems to be coming together in this last year of the international decade. And we have to give CARICOM a lot of credit for taking that <laughs> decision in 2013 in Trinidad and of biting the bullet because geopolitically, 
You know, we don't have a lot of power, but truth is power. An organization is power. And if you're going to pursue, and let me come to the indentorship thing, we all learn in school that structure follows strategy. And that's why I'm arguing that the best structure to support the strategy of including indentorship and colonialism must be separate commissions. Must be separate commission. Eric Phillips. Eric is the chairman of the Guyana Reparations Commission. He's also a leading member of ACDA and um, has been involved in so many causes of African Guyanese and African. I'm a vice chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. No. And vice chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Eric, we, you've got work if you look at the screen. Um, <laughs> fear, yes, or in. Um, yeah. We, we, we shall. Yeah, the Haiti story is fascinating because yeah. you need to go through the details. And I have a cousin, his name is Robert Passard, who is in Guyana. He wrote a book, America Owes a Lot to Haiti. And that story is lost on how America became America yes. with the 700,000 square miles added to them that they bought from the French. Yes. And that was part of the Haitian battle. Yes, the Louisiana oh, Purchase, the Louisiana Yeah, purchase. precisely. Yes. We yes. don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, or in Michelle. It is because of Haiti. Yeah, um, we <laughs> shall, we shall, we shall do. A um, fascinating place. Um, I, I, I always say, outside of my own Guyana, there are three places that I visited and I felt immediately at home when I went to Haiti or whenever I've gone to Haiti. Salvador in Brazil. Brazil. And my first visit to South Africa when they took yes. me to a village to initiate. You know, you're visible. Yes. You know that area. Yes. Yes. It's a village. Incredible. And, they, and when I got to that village, within my first five minutes, I saw about home. Seven, so much at all. I saw about yeah. seven people that I know in my village, Boxton. I said, Look, guys, Miss Frida, look how the lady walking. Yeah, and her look, face. Oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> Haiti! And I, 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 my first visit to Haiti, I spent in Jack Mill, so yeah, up there in the countryside, so in the heart of things. Haiti, Salvador uh, in in Brazil, and that village that they took us to that afternoon, we landed. They took us. David, to I've been village. invited to go to Salvador next month in a pre-meeting for the ninth Pan-African Congress. Oh, good. Yeah, I lived seven and a half years in South Africa, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and my stepfather, my mom's second husband, was Haitian, so I spent a lot of time in Cap Haitian. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And when you meet Haitians in New York, it's a, such a rich culture. They're yes. brilliant people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I've never met a more resilient people. Never met people. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we Guyanese can be resilient, but sometimes we just drop your hand in the air. I have never seen an Asian. Don't feel sorry for me. They always tell you that. Yes, yes. Don't, 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 don't feel sorry for us. If we no. want to grow food for the whole Caribbean, just bring some Haitians here. Oh, yeah. They're incredible oh, yeah. agriculturists and hard workers and full of pride. You know, they, anything they do, they want to do to the best of their ability, whether it's cleaning the yard or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric Phillips here, of course. And, you know, once we get into these, um, uh, these talks around the fire, you know, <laughs> um, uh, I think it was Merchant who said we sat around the fire chanting and, you know, Bob Marley said, you know, no woman, no cry, you know. He says, you know, um, I remember we used to sit around the fire sharing corn meal porridge, of which I share with you. My feet is my only courage. I mean, the artists are yeah, really expressing yeah. um, that sitting around the fire. And in a sense, what we do here and what we've been doing here tonight is sitting around the fire and really talking about Black people's business in a dignified way, in a dignified way. And that's what I think some of those who would like us to forget about Africa, forget about this. They're talking about India, you know, by the way. And they always talk about India, you know. Um, and they could because they're Muniram and they're Prashad. They don't have to open their mouth. 
right? The mandirs and the, the mask, they, they don't have to open their mouth because the end of slavery ensured that in the context of the oppression, that culturally, culturally, they were able to survive. They were intact culturally. Yes, culturally, economically and politically, they were beaten up like the rest of us. Maybe less, but still beaten up. But culturally, and that is the fundamental difference with the other experience and the African experience. And that is, and it's a minor miracle. Some will say a major miracle that we can still stand erect in 2024 and call ourselves African without shame and talk about our history and our connected history, you know, because this is Africa, you know, but Africa in the diaspora and the diaspora returning to Africa and creating a new diaspora. Yes. You, 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 you know? You know, and there's a way in which Southern Africa and Eastern Africa was not in, involved in the slave trade, but because of the diaspora, yes, eh, they are connected. And it's so beautiful to sit and to and talk. And David, when you go to Kenya, Mombasa, you had the Arab slave trade. Uh, and so that's another history another story altogether. There. Another story there. I missed that trip. And uh, Eric, you know, you still have to arrange for me. Yes, to be yes, yes. Definitely this year. As, as chief Uhuru, I, yes, I, I still have to have come to... And, and complete the cycle. Yes, you, have to, you have to arrange for me because I missed people. last year's last yeah. year's meeting in Kenya. In Kenya yeah. uh, right. Well, Kenya, you know, I mean, uh, uh, oh, come on, David. When I was growing up, as you were growing up, we said Kenya. Yes. Kenya is a new story. We said Kenya. Yeah, Kenya. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eric, thanks very much. Um, your closing thoughts before you go. I think in the Caribbean, we need to start to recognize each other's contributions and the harms that have been put on us through this evolution of Guyana. And I think if we understand that, we will come to the type of understanding that even though we didn't came, come in the same ships, because the ships are fundamentally different, yeah. that in order to maximize Guyana, we need to find a political solution in which everyone is included and where we have shared benefits, shared responsibility. And if we do that with the cultural mix we have in Guyana and with the resources we have in Guyana, no country can stop us. You cannot row a boat with one hand. And that's what we're trying to do. And if we do that, not only will the one hand fall off, but everyone, the boat will go in all sorts of directions without our control. So I plead to our politicians to understand our history, to understand the shared hurts of our people, and to do the right thing in addressing problems appropriately. You can't mix indentureship with slavery and indentures and indigenous genocide. Colonialism is a box by itself. And if we were to do this and be honest with ourselves, we would really be an incredible, incredible example to the rest of the world. That's and what I'd like to say, David. An incredible example to the rest of the world. Eric Phillips, thank you very much, my brother, for coming through. I know sometimes it's difficult to catch you because you're always on the move. You no, know, we have reparations every Thursday, so I have to rush. Right, 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 right. And then you were in Panama last week. And yeah. You're always on the Dominican move. Dominican Republic, which is... We went there for the IDB, and the issue there is the IDB is now making the argument that Afro-descendants should be looked upon as a distinct group in the way Amerindians have. There because you all, if you don't do that, then you will the legacies will continue to create inequality. Yes. And so yes. we have to look at the real history, the harms, the hurts, and find appropriate solutions. Find appropriate solutions. I know some people are uncomfortable with the term ancestral land because they're saying, well, we came. 
um, we came. And so how can our lands be ancestral lands? But and David, we indigenized 15,000 square miles. Yes. Indigenized it from the swamp. Yes. And 473,000 of our ancestors died That's over a 200 year period. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, my, you know, um, as you all can tell from my demeanor, I love these kinds of conversations, partly because I know what they do for us as a people in terms of our confidence, in terms of, of our consciousness, and the people who accuse us that we want to socialize Black people to broke up the country and want, uh, no, these conversations, <laughs> not to broke up the country, we want socialize Black people to own the country as uh, uh, as 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 equal parts of 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 Guyana, we want to socialize an African Guyanese population, not to demand more than you deserve, but to demand all you deserve. We want to socialize black people to believe that they are people, equal people, be, 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 endowed with all all the qualities, all the 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 the, the talents that God and the ancestors have bestowed. We want to socialize black people to love themselves as a prerequisite to loving others, loving others. There's a residue of love among African Guyanese. They have to be among black people anywhere in the world. You don't go through 400 years of enslavement and still hug the descendants of your enslavers. You have to have great love, great love, great love. And you have to have great love because you're human beings. You're human beings. And we are all, we are. And as Bob Marley say, we are what we are. And that's the way it's going to be. You can't educate I for no equal opportunity. No, 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 no. We have to educate you about what is equality and what is equity, and what is justice. Because we uh, were taken to the bottomless pit, as Brother Bob said, the bottomless pit. And here we are to tell the story. And our stories are being told through our voices, our voices in novels, in books, and in the film, in, in these podcasts, and whatever you call them. We tell our stories because we continue to have to tell stories. And we end back in them. We end back in them. Nobody go run me from where me come from. Me papa must niam, me daddy must niam, me picnic must niam. Nobody go run me from where me come from. Emmanuel McLean, the Antiguan maestro, the great short short. Nobody go run me from where me come from. Nobody go run me. No, you will not run us from where we come from. We love Guyana. We love the Caribbean. And we love being all we are. And we are basically African for those of us who are African. But we are also Guyanese. We are also West Indian. We are also African. One of my heroes, Rex Netherford, Professor Rex Netherford, he calls it chaos in order and order in chaos. And as he said, only we have the capacity to negotiate that order in chaos and that chaos in order. Yes, tonight we've been talking about reparations and we talk about the, we have been talking about the West Africa of the Caribbean, Haiti. The West Africa, Haiti is more West Africa than West Africa itself. They always make the mistake, you know. They, 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 they try to whiten Brazil by mixing up, and all they end up doing is creating 300 and odd shades of black. <laughs> they tried to isolate Haiti after 1804, and what they did, what they did was help to reproduce Africa in its virgin self, untouched, 
the Americans never recognized Haiti until after the abolition of slavery in the 1860s. They isolated Haiti, and Haiti was able to reproduce West Africa. They were able to mix up the, 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 the Yoruba and the Igbo and the, 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 the Fulanis and, and, and mix up the Mandingos and everybody mix up together and create Africa. Africa. So in Brazil, they create 300 shades of Africa. The Americans say, we're going to separate. Brazil said we're going to integrate. And in, in integrating, they create a whole set of black people with different shades, with different shades. America separate, but in separating, they allow Africans to reproduce themselves as Africans. <laughs> oh, what a lovely story. No, they all don't get me going. I'm gone because it's Thursday night and I got to prepare for Friday. Friday is the day I just go and do my little shopping. I don't do my shopping Wednesday or Friday. Wednesday is sales day. And then Friday is weekend sales. So I miss me. I miss my Wednesday shopping because I didn't get to see it. I wasn't feeling too much over the weather. I was little under the weather. Um, and so I got to go and do my shopping early tomorrow morning. I catch in, I catch in the weekend sale. Friday, Saturday, Sunday sale. I go catch Friday because I catch the thing when it's fresh. When it fresh. So I gone. I can't stay much longer with you all. I am gone. Tomorrow night I'll be here. Um, well, you all know my normal friends on, 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 on Friday night. But Eric will be back for us to talk about Haiti. And I'm so glad that you all have requested. And always remember, we are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. If you hear me,